Now we're going to look more in depth into this idea of a invariant zero. So given a transfer function, or really a state space model, the value lambda is an invariant zero if there's a right null space of this matrix. Okay, uh, non-trivial non right null space. So that is, there's a vector x naught u naught such that when I multiply by this, I get zero. So this actually gives me two equations: this times x naught plus b times u naught, c times x naught plus d times u naught. I can now write these two equations this way. Okay, I can bring this over to the other side, this over to the other side, so actually the x naught terms over to the other side. So I can basically write u naught in terms of x naught. And so notice in taking this over to the other side, I, I switched, switched the two terms. Uh, here I got a negative sign coming out. Okay, so these two, so if there is such an x naught and u naught, then I can write b and d, b u naught, d u naught, this way in terms of x naught. Okay, so that's there's a relationship between u naught and x naught, and, and these are how the, how they're defined. So if our system now starts at initial condition x is zero is equal to x naught, and if we apply this particular eigenfunction to our system, e to the lambda t, so lambda is not just any value. It's at, an, it's at an invariant zero. And notice we also have in a direction, u naught. Okay, so we're gonna now apply this to our system. All right, let's see what happens. So when we do this, so this is that function in the Laplace domain. I'm now gonna apply this to the transfer function with an initial condition. So remember, when our system has an initial condition, this is actually the response in the Laplace domain. I have this, I have this um, initial condition term, and then I have this term that involves the um, the input vector. <clears throat> so this, so d times u naught can be written as minus c x naught. And b u naught can be written as lambda i minus a x naught from the previous slide. Okay, so notice that in this expression, every term has c on the left and x naught on the right. So even though I have this term floating around, and that should be a one, um, even though I have this term floating around, um, it is this is just a scalar. So this doesn't affect the fact that I have C matrix on the left, X naught on the right, you know, all these terms. So if I factor those out, and actually if I factor out C SI minus A inverse on the left and X naught on the right from all of these expressions, I will get this expression in the middle. Okay, so that that's what's coming out. So notice S minus lambda is actually going to come in this term here. Um, I'm sorry. It's actually going to come in this term here. So when we when we um, multiply through, or rather factor out an s minus lambda, also I'm going to have s minus lambda i coming here minus. So this term doesn't have an si minus a inverse, but it does have an s minus lambda in the denominator. So this term is going to become minus si minus a. And then this term, I have the c si minus a that factors out, and I have the x naught on the right, so I just get this term. So I get three terms. This lambda minus lambda i is going to cancel with this positive lambda i. This s times i is going to cancel with this s times i. This minus minus a is going to cancel with this minus a. And so all of these terms cancel. And so all of this quantity is equal to zero. So what is this saying? With this initial condition and this input to our system, our output is identically zero.
we get exactly zero. So if we use the direction and the value of our zero, we will get an output. So we, we apply a non-zero input to our system. We start with a non-zero initial condition and the output is identically zero for all time. Pretty amazing. Well, that's the zero property. So we have, so this is a property of invariant zeros. So how do we compute invariant zeros? How do we find a lambda that makes that thing happen and the direction? Okay, well, we have these different cases. We have square systems and non-square systems. And we're going to look specifically also at observable, what I call observable and uncontrollable systems. We'll come back later and talk about what uncontrollability or controllability and observability really mean later. But for now, we're going to see how all of this plays in together. So we start with a square system. That is, the number of inputs is equal, a number of outputs equal to the number of inputs. Remember, our transfer function matrix is of dimension P by M. And I'm going to define this system matrix. In, th in this case, this system matrix is square because we have the same number of inputs as outputs. And so A, B, C, D, this will be a square matrix. And I'm going to define the matrix E to be of this form. And I specifically use an E to give you the sense that I'm actually using a projection matrix. This is actually a projection matrix. You can show that if I multiply this by itself, I'll get the, the same matrix back. And actually, it's a projector because it's also uh, symmetric. So if I take this quantity and take the determinant of it, of this quantity, or the, that will give me a polynomial. The root of that polynomial is an invariant zero. Okay, so lambda, lambda will satisfy the determinant of this. Plugging in lambda, I'll get zero. So that's what happens if we have a square system. So again, the quantity, in general, this, this quantity, determinant of s minus lambda e, is a polynomial in lambda. The roots of the polynomial are the invariant zeros. Associated with each invariant zero, so if this determinant is equal to zero, that means there is a non-trivial null space associated with that. And so there is a vector, a non-zero vector, such that I can mu multiply that times the non-zero vector and get zero. So it turns out this is actually called, this problem of finding lambda and vi is called a generalized eigenvalue problem. It's like an eigenvalue, so notice E is like an identity matrix, so si minus, so lambda i minus s, it's kind of like an eigenvalue problem. It's called a generalized eigenvalue problem. And the invariant zeros and their vectors can be found in MATLAB using eig. And uh, remember, there may be zeros at infinity. So in general, this, this process, when you use eig, will give zeros at infinity. And, and vectors associated with that. That is, there, uh, you'll have a zero at infinity and a vector associated with it. So that's what happens when we have a square system, when p is equal to m. When p is not equal to m, that is, we either have more inputs than outputs or more outputs than inputs, the system matrix is not square. And so we have s we define this way. We can still define it this way. And e is now defined this way, where we have to take into account the non-squareness. OK? so. This is what we have. And um, we can still define m the same way. In this case, we have an invariant 0 lambda if the matrix m defined in the same way we had previously, if, it, if the rank of that matrix drops. Okay, So that's a kind of a different problem than what we looked at before. Before, we could just compute the determinant. But in our case, this matrix is not square. m is not square. So you cannot compute the determinant of this, okay? And so how do we detect a drop in rank? So again, giving, given these matrices defined here, we can define something called the normal rank of a system. That's the rank of M for all values of S except the system zeros, okay? When S is not a system zero, then this will have its maximum rank, and that's, we call that the normal rank. In general, for any value of s, m is just a matrix. So even though it looks, you know, it's a function of s, if s is just a value, say s is 1, 
um, this is just going to be a matrix. In general, since the matrix is not square, we cannot use the determinant like we did with the square system. In general, the normal rank of a system is the lesser of n plus p or n plus m. That is the number of states plus the number of outputs or the number of states plus the number of inputs. So I said, usually, if the normal rank is less than the minimum of these two, that means we either have redundant inputs or redundant outputs. That is, in, the inputs are such that you're basically, they're linearly independent, uh, dependent on one another, or the outputs are linearly dependent on one another. So in, in this case, we would remove the redundancy. That is, uh, if we have redundant inputs, we would remove, we would make the, the, the B matrix such that you have uh, independent columns, or the C matrix such that you have independent rows. Okay, that is, we, we eliminate redundant inputs and redundant outputs. Okay, so assuming now that the redundancy is removed, so what, so what happens if we don't remove the redundancy? Well, that means you're going to have zeros. You, you have zeros everywhere. That is, you can always find uh, a zero for a system. Okay, and in which case it, it's not meaningful. Okay, so we, we, we're concerned about the meaningful invariant zeros. And so having now a, re, removed the redundancy, we now define the quantity n of s to be m of s transposed m of s if m is less than p, m of s times m of s transpose if p is less than m. So basically, this corresponds to the case when I have more outputs than inputs. This is the case when I have more inputs than outputs. And so basically what this does is this gives me a square matrix that is the smaller of m by m or p by p. That's what it's giving me. It's giving me a, it's giving me a square matrix. But it's the smaller of those two. So having defined this then, n of s, so notice b, these are now square matrices. n is now a square matrix. Regardless of which definition we use, we're going to get a square matrix. So if n of lambda determinant is equal to 0 for some lambda, then lambda is an invariant 0. In general, uh, the determinant of n is going to be a polynomial in S, and the roots are the invariant zeros. So this is how we would compute invariant zeros for a non-square system. So notice we basically uh, take the matrix times its transpose, which is kind of like computing the magnitude squared of that matrix. It's kind of like that, except you end up with a square matrix. All right, so these are invariant zeros for non-square systems. Stay tuned for transmission zeros.